All right. All right. For those of you who are sitting, you may join us standing up. Uh, as we're about to read the, uh, the word for this morning, our teaching text will be in Ephesians 4, 1 to 6, and we have Lily up here reading it for us. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear God, thank you so much for this morning. We ask you to speak to us, teach us, grow us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Last night when the hogs won, uh, I knew we were in trouble. I, I texted Fitz last night. I was like, I know you're pumped up to MC in the morning. Uh, and I think what I'm going to do now, I'm going to start to schedule Fitz to MC on bye weeks. So, so we can just know what to expect. But uh, um, it, it's always a good time, especially when the Hogs win on a Sunday morning. Uh, but today we're going to have the last part of our Ephesians series. This is the last week of Ephesians series. I'm really excited. But I'm really excited for next week. Next week we're going to be starting a vision series. And we're going to look at what's the vision for New Life Church as a whole, but also very specifically for us as a downtown campus, what is our vision, what is our part of playing So I want to actually ask you guys to be in prayer with us this next week. As we look at the vision, God is stirring something up in our hearts and God is placing some potential new, new steps in our seats, but we want to make sure we know exactly what God is asking us to do, as for us as a church to, what, to take our next step. So please be praying for that. But today, we're going to talk about unity, okay? We're going to talk about the topic of unity, and this is something that I actually believe that our church right here does a really good job at. I think this is a core value of ours to have unity amongst us, and I want to give us some reminders today, but also want to keep us alert for things that could get in the way of unity. So we want to talk about unity, but also we want to talk about the pieces that could take away from our unity. But right here in the, in the third verse, it says, make every effort to keep the unity, of the Spirit through the bond of peace. It is our job to make every effort to keep the unity. And talking about making every effort, it reminded me of a time that we planned a family trip with the Dukes, okay? At that point, it was last year's summer, I think, and we had five kids under four years old, four adults, vehicles, car seats, all had to be coordinated, and it was actually, it took every effort of us to make that trip happen. Because if you try to go anywhere with five kids under four, it's a nightmare. I don't know why we should do that, right? So we make the plan, we create a document, we, we figure out who's packing the applesauces, who's packing the, uh, the, the cribs and the pack and plays and whatever you need for all this stuff for the kids, right? We make the plan and actually it's looking like it's gonna happen. We can't believe it, like it, this, this trip might actually happen. But then days before the trip, we get some really bad news. We, we hear, we find out that a sickness is breaking out in our daycares. Oh no, all right. Who knows how that goes, right? You take your kids to school, they come home sick at all times. So we actually on the phone, me and Bronson were talking and we we're trying to hype each other up or convince ourselves to not take our kids to school anymore for the next couple of days to make every effort to make this trip happen. So I'm pretty sure I lost, like I, I took off of work to watch my own kids just to make this trip happen. We did whatever it takes, we did whatever it took. And we made the trip happen, it was amazing, but it took us making every effort to pull it off. And in the same way, this is the same way for us when it comes to the unity amongst us. We have to make every effort to keep the unity. We gotta plan for it, we gotta communicate for it, we gotta do our part or it's not gonna happen. It takes us all making every effort and we have to do whatever it takes to, to maintain unified. Now, this morning we're gonna talk about three things that will help us in keeping unity, but we're also gonna talk about things that will breathe unity, that will strengthen unity, and that will build unity. But also, with every point, I'm gonna give us a unity killer, something that is, can stop the unity from happening. And I just want us all to be aware, and I'll give you a pastoral warning, that these unity killers are so potent, so dangerous, that they can ruin unity in a moment. It can take years to build unity, but in one moment you can ruin unity, with a unity killer. Now, a lot of you guys know that my wife and I, we get to flip houses, so we 
move into a house, we flip it and we sell, move to the next house. And the, the current house that we're in right now, when we looked at that, it needed a lot of work, okay? It was, a, it was a piece of work. We had to do a lot of stuff to get this house looking right. But as we were touring it, we saw it, and I actually loved the backyard, because it was so green. We got to go out there, and it was so green, you couldn't even see our neighbors in the back, you couldn't see the neighbors on the side, because these beautiful vines had grown up on the fence lines, and it was just, it was just amazing looking, it was beautiful. And you know, it had to have been years for these vines to grow up all over every fence. It was all beautiful, lush and green, and it was amazing. So we moved in, we started focusing on the inside. So we did the work on the inside, so the outside got neglected, okay? So I needed some help. So I called Damon, our uh, um, local M18 landscaping expert right here, and I said, hey Damon, give it up for Damon real quick. He, he doesn't need that because, yeah. So I call him and he's like, yeah, of course I'll help you out. He's come, I'm, I'm gonna spray for weeds, keep it simple for you. So, you know, it's end of summer, he sprays for the weeds and everything is going by plan. Everything's dying down pretty good. Uh, and um, it was good, but he came and he sprayed and it worked. Not a single living thing in the area he sprayed survived, okay? <laughs> I don't know what he came with, but I think he had some commercial grade mixture, you know. M18 know this substance is pretty good, so I don't know what he put in there, all right? I don't know, don't ask me. Some of that might be not even legal, I don't know. You can ask him later about that. But it killed everything. I have a picture for you guys from this beautiful tree that used to have vines all over it. Show the picture real quick of the, fir- the big picture of the tree, there you go. This was all vines, and you can see in the background, there's a dead tree, okay? There's a small, like medium-sized tree that's just dead because, Mount, uh, because Damon sprayed a long time ago. <laughs> now, in the winter, it was great because it looked like all the same, right? In the wintertime, it was fine, but then the first spring came along and it wouldn't come back to life. And season through season, this is a picture taken last week, okay? He sprayed years ago for, for his stuff, all right? But look at me for a second because in it's the same way with unity in the church. We can be building trust, we can be building unity for years, and one moment of Damon's potent spray, okay? <laughs> one moment, years of relationship can be broken. Unity can be fallen apart because of one unity killer. And this has happened to us, this happens to all of us. I know this happens to Jess and I, where we have some long-term friends, and within, within one moment, the relationship is broken. I know it happened in here, maybe it's church or through a church split, one moment of a church splitting and people are lost. Maybe it's with friendships that you have that are broken apart for years. Maybe it's a job that is changing in front of your eyes because of one moment. So we all know the feeling of these unity killers. And the sad part is, in those moments, it's gonna take time to rebuild. Just like with my vines, like I said, this is a picture from this week. I'm still rebuilding my vines somehow. I don't know how. Uh, if you have tips and tricks for that, come see me afterwards. Uh, but I wanted to, if you zoom into this picture, show the next picture, this is when you zoom in. It's shrine. And listen, there's hope for us. When unity is broken, when trust is uh, broken, when we have a relationship that's fallen apart, in Christ we have hope. See, things can be restored, relationships can be mended, Church hurt can be healed and trust can be restored. And it's up to us to make every effort to do so. It's up to you right here, next, the person next to you, you, all of us in this very room, it's up to us to make every effort to keep the unity. Point one, how we're gonna do that is to walk in humility. Walk in humility. Ephesians 4, 1 to 2 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, and I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another. Now, raise your hand in here if you've been completely humble in your life. Nice and high, okay. There you go. So now we all have not been completely humble. All right, thank you. If you raise your hand, that's part of it, right? Now listen. We all have that calling. It's a strong challenge for us to be completely humble. That's hard to achieve. But let's look at what humility actually is and then maybe we can get to the point of how we can live that out. The Greek word for humility is tupe frosoni, okay? That's how I would say it at least. Is lowliness in mind. Lowliness doesn't mean to think of ourselves poorly. Someone who thinks poorly of themselves might say, I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. I can't amount to anything. I can never contribute to a church. I can never do anything great. God would never use me. That is thinking poorly of yourself and that is not what, what, what humility is. That is insecurity. 
And God will never require that of you. God is not requiring insecurity from us. He's requiring humility from us. And I think we all heard a quote from Tim Keller about how humility is not thinking about yourself less, but thinking about yourself. It's not thinking less about yourself, sorry. It's not thinking less about yourself, but thinking about yourself less. So if it's not thinking less of myself, what is it? A better definition is found when we look at Philippians 2, 3. It says, with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. More important than yourselves. And we actually do this all the time, or some of you guys do this all the time. For example, this week we got to spend some time with the other campus pastors in Memphis. And we were hanging out in the lobby, and suddenly one of the Do Perfect guys rolls in. Anybody knows, who knows what Do Perfect is? Some YouTube guys, okay? For those who are older, they're famous people, okay? So this famous person pulls up. They do YouTube videos. It doesn't make sense, but they do trick shots, and it was great. And it was so refreshing because this guy, he's famous, has a lot of money, but he still had to struggle with unpacking all the pack and place for his kids and loaded with diaper bags and, you know, with flip-flops on and socks. It was great to see. He's just one of us. But... Some of our guys went over to take some pictures because their kids know them, so they took some selfies with them. And no worries, I played it really cool, okay? I don't have a picture to show you guys because I'm the cool guy. I didn't take a picture. I let him be. Uh, but this is how, one way how we see somebody else as more important than ourselves. We go over and take a selfie with somebody else because we think that they are more important in a way, right? We, 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 we see that. But who of you guys in here, when you go to Sisterhood on Tuesdays, or to the men's uh, night on Wednesday coming up, or maybe your life group, you walk in thinking to yourself, wow, I get to be in the group with this guy, and he is in middle management. Isn't that awesome? Or oh, hey, this girl in my life group, she actually helps with a financial investment group. Isn't that cool? I get to be in her group. And then some of you guys might, you would never think this, like, hey, I might even take a selfie with that person at the end of group. I'm gonna go in and say, hey, can I take a selfie with you? But that is how it's supposed to be. We're supposed to regard others as more important than ourselves. So what's an area that how we can be humility, we can be humble, we can have humility, and how does that actually translate to unity? I want to show you in our marriages. Being humble will unify you and your spouse. After a long day coming home, thinking of your wife and your kids' needs as more important than your own desire to flop down on a couch is how you show humility. And that will breathe unity in your, in your marriage. In our families, the way we interact with our kids unifies our families. In our work, we can think of others first. We can think of our coworkers' needs above our own. Maybe, this is crazy, helping somebody else's project at work without your, you getting any benefit from it, without you getting anything from it, helping them out with their project, but they're running behind. That is how we can show humility and it's gonna breathe unity. At this church, in this very church body right here in front of you, the people around you, you have an, a, a, you have an opportunity to be an agent of humility and think of others as more important than yourself. When you hear somebody in, in, in your life going through something, and the person in church and they're having a hard time, you can step up and regard them as more important than your own needs in the moment. So before we get to the unity killer of humility and what that looks like, I want to add one more thing to this that can easily get mixed up because unity is not uniformity, okay? Unity is not uniformity. So unity is being united or joined together despite differences. And uniformity is being the same, being uniform, being identical. It's kind of like with your kids and your family, right? None of your kids are identical. They're not uniform. They're not the same. But they're united to be part of the family. And this is a common misconception in the church as well, because we think a church, you have to come in and you have to start becoming uniform like everybody else is. That you have to think the same, act the same, dress the same, do all the things the same. But God's word rather speaks to different people with different gifts, different ages, different races, coming together to be united by our common faith in Jesus Christ. That is unity, that's not uniformity. Now for a unity killer in this first point, is don't let pride be your guide. So when we walk in humility, that's, that's the way we breathe unity. But the way we get rid of unity in this area is by letting pride be our guide. Most of the times when I look back, when I've hurt somebody, it was m most of the times because I let pride be my guide. I was thinking of myself as more important than others. Take a moment for you, whatever the last conflict is that you had, maybe it was this week, this morning, last week, Last month, if you, didn't do a, if you didn't start a conflict in a month, come see me, please. I'm, I'm impressed with you, okay? <laughs> but think of that moment for a second. 
and look back of who was your guide. Was pride your guide in that moment or did you make every effort to keep the unity in Christ? Because humility is our way to, to unity. That is the way we do it. So don't let pride be your guide, but walk in humility. Point two, maintain a pure heart. And again, we're going to jump around in Ephesians a little bit today. So we have the teaching text, but we're going to actually jump to the back end now. And verses 31 to 32. Get rid of all bitterness, rage and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Our hearts require routine maintenance. We have to maintain a pure heart. We have to do an actual effort to maintain a pure heart. So I want to see you raise your hands if you love brushing your teeth at night. Like, who loves it? Like, you, you just, I'm not asking if you do it, but you love it. Who loves it? Okay, a couple people. Okay, good, good job. Okay. Now, now put your hands down. Now I want to see your hands up if you hate getting a root canal treatment done. Come on, who hates that? That should be about everybody. Unless you didn't have one yet, your hand should be up, okay? Because it's, 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 that's, that's the worst. Now listen, our teeth require routine maintenance. Daily brushing, flossing, all those things. Now if we don't, we all know that plaque will build up. If it's not taken care of long enough, you have a cavity. And if you don't take care of it then, you might even have to get a root canal treatment. Nobody likes the big procedures, but some people also don't love to maintain a good routine. Here's, here's your choice. You have to pick either the daily maintenance or the severe interference later on. It's one or the other. There's no other way around it. Either you do the, the daily work, the daily routine, or you have the big, severe um, interference in the end. Now, in the same way, we have to take care of our heart to keep a pure heart over time. Because through neglect, if we don't maintain our heart pure through time, through neglect, it's going to build up, it's going to build up, and we'll have to deal with a bigger problem later on. Now, we all experience hard things in life that can surface many emotions in our hearts. There's anger, bitterness, pain, offense, discouragement, frustrations. Those are hard things that can come up in our hearts that we can hang on to if we want to, or we can get rid of those things. But the question is, what do we do when we experience those emotions in our heart? Do we fuel them? Do we suppress them? Do we try to avoid them? Are we allowing those emotions to lead us? Now, here's the thing. Part of growing up and maturing in Christ is becoming a fully devoted follower of Christ, is learning how to maintain a pure heart. That is part of our job, our uh, process as we come closer to Jesus and we walk more like him. It has to become a, a discipline that we do, which is to maintain a pure heart. Ephesians 4, 26 to 27, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you're still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. See, the Bible doesn't say here, don't be angry. It doesn't say that. It says when you're angry, right? When you're angry, don't sin. So it's talking about how we're going we're gonna to feel anger. We're going to feel those emotions. All those things are real in our lives. But we have to choose not to let that lead us to sin. So when you feel angry, how do you respond to that anger? That's the question we have to ask. He's encouraged, Paul is encouraging us to not let anger and other things like that linger in our hearts. So we need to deal with them in a timely manner so it doesn't lead to sin. Just like with our toothbrushing habits. Here's, here's what, I'm going to repeat this twice for you guys. This is important, I think. Resolve small problems in a timely manner, or over time, it will lead to bigger problems. That goes for every area of your life. Resolve small problems in a timely manner, or over time, it will lead to bigger problems. We have to deal with our small things, our small problems, our emotions in the moment. So how do we do it? Ephesians 4.31, it says... Get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. Paul says, get rid of it. Get rid of it. When these emotions come up, we find God honoring ways to work through them and deal with them. And as we work through them, we ask God to replace them with things like compassion, kindness, and forgiveness. He can do the work for us. It's not up to us, but we bring them to God. The Puritans in the 16th and 17th centuries coined this phrase, it's called, keep short accounts with both God and men. Keep short accounts with both God and men. That means 
we don't want to add and add and stack and stack and stack stuff against people, but keep them short. Resolving small things when they come up, resolve them fast, paying off those debts fast. And this can help us so much because we all have a tendency to hold on to stuff longer than it needs to. Some of us are still holding on to things that people said years ago. And it's time for you to process that and bring it to the Lord. And others of you guys, you might still holding on to bitterness and anger towards God from something that happened years ago. It's also time for you to bring that to God and resolve that. We can keep short accounts with the Lord and with people. It's up to us. So here's some practical things that will help us to resolve matters properly. The first one is the most important one, in prayer. In prayer with God, processing your anger with God before you react. Confessing to God how you mistreated somebody. Asking God to help you release bitterness and offense. Forgiving someone in prayer by remembering how you have been forgiven as well. The other way to do it is to talk into a trusted person. Talking to them about what you've been going through or support and for asking for wisdom. Maybe it's through a much needed confrontational conversation to work towards resolution and peace. Asking them to forgive you, forgiving them. Now, I already mentioned it, but the unity killer for this section, for, this, for, for us to maintain a pure heart, is living with offense and bitterness. If we live with offense and bitterness, we will never be able to maintain, maintain a pure heart. Nelson Mandela used to say, resentment is like drinking poison and then hoping it will kill your enemies. And it's the same with living with, with offenses or bitterness. You're just, you're holding on to that bitterness, you're holding on to those offenses, and you're hoping the other person is hurting from it. But that's not how it works. It's just, you're hurting yourself. Now unchecked, these things can take root, and unchecked, those things can grow into unforgiveness and being easily offended all the time and contempt towards others. Here's a quote from David Gutzig that I love on this topic. It says, the devil's work is to accuse and divide the family of God, that's us right here, and to sow discord among them. When we harbor anger in our heart, we do the devil's work for him. That's what the enemy wants. The enemy wants us to hold on to these things so we can be part of his agenda of spreading division and holding on to anger, holding on to bitterness. He wants division, but we want to have unity. So today, during our response time, I want to encourage you that today you can look at your heart and start a new clean process to maintain a pure heart. You can bring him those unresolved areas and start a process to maintain a pure heart. And it might be prayer, it might be prayer and some counseling, it might be whatever you need to do to get this right. I want to encourage you to start the process today. So that way, we can be part of bringing unity to those around us and not achieving the enemy's goal of having division in our family. Last point, point three, speaking life. Ephesians 4.25, therefore each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to his neighbor, for we are all members of one body. And in 4.29 it says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. A lot of you guys know, for the last decade, I worked for the, for the Arkansas Dream Center and we had a blast getting to help disciple uh, kids in an urban setting and we had such a good time, but a lot of times we would have new kids come in and they would walk in and they would cuss up a storm. And instead of just saying, hey, don't use these words as bad words, we would sit them down and say, okay, here's the principle of speaking life. Here's why we use words that are helping people build up. Why, is, why we don't use words that drag people down. The principle of our, of, our, of, our, um, of our words. Now, I'm currently still working on the same principle for my five-year-old daughter, okay? We're, we're working on that as well. Um, yeah, she hasn't been cussing up a storm, I'll tell you that, that's a good point. <laughs> that is a great point, yeah. But here's what she did say, okay? So the other morning, she came into our bedroom early and snuggled up for a second. So we're all, you know, laying in bed together. And at some point, I open my eyes and she's like right in front of me. And she's looking at me and she says this, Dad, could you stop breathing? That's kind of harsh words for a five-year-old who doesn't contribute anything in the house, okay? In my own bed, she tells me this. So I did the only right thing. I turned over and cried internally and uh, let it go. But our words have power. Our words have the power to speak life or death. One of the best ways to keep unity is by, with our words. 
And one of the fastest ways to lose unity is with our words. Our words are important. See, we can be so quick to make fun, to say things, to joke too much, to have excessive sarcasm, to tell lies, to insult people. It's so easy. It goes fast. But as Christ followers, we're supposed to be different. We're supposed to be different. Paul says in Ephesians 4.29, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth. The word, un the word unwholesome in Greek means rotten or worthless. And Paul is challenging us to not let any of these kind of words that are rotten or worthless come out of our mouth. And listen, that's hard. We're all humans. We make mistakes in this. But we can come back to God and He can help us. Proverbs 18 tells us that we can either speak life or death. We can either build up or we can tear down. Now, some of you guys might think, okay, that's nice and all. I can speak, I can be more nice, I guess, in my words, but some people need to hear the truth, okay? And if nobody else tells them the truth, I will step up and be the guy who tells them the truth. But today, I want to challenge us that there's a way to combine those things together. We can have a new life skill where we can be honest about a situation, but not tear somebody apart. We can speak truth and love instead of gossiping or bringing condemnation. See, for some of us, it's easy to be loving, but hard to speak the truth. And for others, it's easy to share the truth, but not be loving. We must be both. We gotta speak the truth in love. And if we practice that, if we're willing to make that step, we're gonna keep the unity. So here's three practical steps before you respond to kind of filter through before you respond to make this really easy. The first word is pause, pause. Stop, take a breath, calm down, apply what we talked about in maintaining a pure heart for a second. Check your heart, make sure it's coming from the right motives. And your brain and emotions will need some time to settle before you say something. There's always a good time before you post, before you comment, before you address somebody, before you snap back at somebody to pause. Next thing is ponder. Think about what you might say. Ask yourself, is this going to tear down or build up? And listen, we're not saying don't stand up for people or what is right, but let's use some wisdom in how we communicate those things. The last part, third, is pray. Pray about it. When you pause, you thought about it for a second, let's take a moment and pray and ask God to reveal to you if this is gonna be helpful. Ask Him for wisdom. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you with self-control. Ask God, hey, what I'm about to say, will this dishonor you? Will this, will this help this person? Will this bring division? or will it bring unity? And listen, we got to think 30 days, or maybe 29, I'm not sure, to election day, all right? We got 30 days to practice this really well. Because I promise you right now, there's gonna be times where you're gonna wanna say something really fast. All right? You wanna post something on a, on a social media post, where you wanna address somebody in a, in a very harsh manner. I wanna encourage you to pause. Let's ponder about it for a second. Let's pray and then communicate from there. The unity kill on this one is very easy. Gossip and slander. That's gonna kill unity in this. That's our words. If we use our words the wrong way, it can tear a community apart. If you wanna kill the unity in a family, in a team, at work, wherever you might be, just start gossiping. They'll take care of it. And as a church, I wanna challenge us, let's not be gossiping for, about each other, but let's address somebody what we need to address. We should be doing is, if we have issues with people, we need to talk to them about it and not gossip about others. Let's use our words wisely to bring unity, not division. And as we close today, I wanna to finish reading the last part of Ephesians 4. It's gonna be the last part of Ephesians. Ephesians 4, the last verse, it says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. That's where it all starts. See, Christ came to this earth for us to live a perfect life, to die on the cross, a gruesome death, so we may be close to God again. And He rose from that and sent us our, His helper so we can live out this life, so we can walk in humility, so we can maintain a pure heart, not by our own strength, but by the Holy Spirit living through us. And we can have, we can speak life to people. And He's calling us to live in a Christ-like conduct. And if for those who, this is the first time we hear about Jesus, we're gonna pray in a little bit about accepting Him as your Savior. But for those who've been walking with Christ, 
Maybe it's time for us to be acting like Christ, to have Christ-like conduct. And I want to leave us with this amazing quote right here from uh, Clint Snorgrass. He says this, I just want to say these words and we're going to pray afterwards. And I want you to take this, these words in. They're really powerful. We must renounce self-centeredness in order to walk in humility. We must renounce harshness in order to walk with gentleness. We must renounce the tyranny of our own agendas in order to walk with patience. We must renounce idealistic expectations in order to walk in suffering love. We must renounce indifferences and pass passivity in order to maintain the unity of the Spirit. The church is unified and God is glorified when we live with Christ-like conduct. If you don't mind, bow your heads and close your eyes for a second. I want to take a second moment of prayer. And as we reflect on these words of renouncing those things in us that are not from Him, and embracing those things that are from Him. I just want to pray in a, in a moment for, for anybody who, has, who hasn't turned their, their life to Jesus yet. You haven't heard the, the message of Jesus coming to die for your sins so you can live out a way that is Christ-like conduct. But I also want to pray for us in this room, for those who need to be reminded that this is what we're called to be like. We're not supposed to be like everybody else. We're supposed to be like Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, we just thank you right now for this moment. I pray right now for somebody that's in here that, that has heard the message of Jesus for the first time, that is turning their hearts to you, that you would see them. That as we repent from our sins and we turn from our ways and we embrace your forgiveness, that we are a new creation that can now live like you. Right now, I pray for every person in this room that has been following you, that you help us to be reminded that we are called to be Christ-like people that we have Christ-like conduct in the way we speak, in the way we communicate, in the way we talk, the way we act, and that we glorify you in everything that we do. We're so thankful for you, and we ask that you help us in these areas to be more like you. In Jesus' name, amen.